Consider for a moment Jonestown in Guyana, the site of the largest mass suicide in history. This was the final bastion of the People's Temple, guided under the gentle tutelage of Jim Jones. When Jones realized he was going to be exposed in the press here, he and his flock pulled up the last of their roots in this country and immediately evacuated to Jonestown. There, in the middle of their rustic little village, in the middle of the Guyanese jungle, all the members of the, of the temple became beholden entirely to Jones for all their news and information about the outside world. When he started telling them that the United States and Great Britain had instituted and begun implementing policies to expel all non-Caucasians from both countries, they had no way to know that it wasn't true. If they had known, they would have been a lot less hesitant about turning their backs on him and leaving when it became too much for them. Human beings, you see, are beings of projection. That is, the things that hold true about us are the very things we tend to assume hold true about others. The overwhelming majority of people in Jonestown knew they would never, ever lie about something so serious and so important, so a few times it crossed their minds that someone might, they discounted it. They knew they wouldn't, so they assumed that he wouldn't. The problem with such an approach is that it leaves the honest majority wide open to the conniving, subversive, manipulative machinations of the dishonest minority. I know a fellow who gets all his information from one source. Well, I shouldn't say all of it. He gets news and information from other sources, but he doesn't trust the news and information from, the, from those other sources anywhere it disagrees with that one. He doesn't trust any other sources because this one tells him that every other source is in on a grand conspiracy. I once pointed out the problem of such an approach to another, another mutual acquaintance of ours, and he said that he was sure that the information source in question was right about there being conspiracies everywhere. Now, do I have any difficulty believing that the world is replete with conspiracies? No. But one of the trademarks of a conspiracy is a source of information which takes steps to become your only source. In the feudal days of Europe, each European country was divided up into kingdoms, fiefdoms and such, and the subjects living therein were entirely dependent upon their lords and kings for all their news of everything taking place outside the kingdom. So if those lords and kings were, li were lying to them, they had no way to tell. If the lords and kings profited from the presence of these subjects, and living conditions were better elsewhere, they had no reason to tell them. They had a vested interest in keeping them in the dark about such matters. If you can control how people get their news, you can control what news they get, and you can, and you can subsequently control them. That's why a free press is so important, and why a state-controlled press is properly regarded with suspicion. This is also one important reason why, in the Confederate South, measures were taken to prevent literacy among the slaves. The more literate the slaves became, the less, the less dependent they would be on slave owners for news the more they would be able to instead get their news from the papers, which might put them in a position to learn how slavery is illegal in the North, and to communicate that fact to other slaves. This would give them a motive to escape. And with that motive firmly in place, literacy would also enable them to covertly communicate with one another to coordinate escape attempts. And of course, the more slaves you have coordinating escape attempts, the more those attempts are going to succeed and undermine the Confederacy. These preventive measures sometimes took the form of the allegation that slaves were intrinsically illiterate and couldn't learn to read, so one might as well not even try to teach them. But then they found this didn't prevent people from trying to educate their slaves anyway, and they knew that the more the slave owners made the attempt, the more they would succeed. So then they made laws against it. Anything to prevent a slave from being educated, because the more a classification of people is educated, the harder it is to keep that classification in chains. Today, the conspiracies and would-be fiefdoms must rely on other means. They may rely on this allegation about every other source being part of the same conspiracy. They may call every other source liberally biased, while calling themselves fair and balanced, whatever balanced means, and whatever standard is used to determine what constitutes fair. They may rattle off a long list of claims and call them secret, since after all some people will believe anything if you tell them it's a secret. The rational, wise individual turns to multiple independent sources for his or her news and is wary about, about getting into situations in which multiple independent information sources are not available. Such a situation opens one's well to be poisoned. This is why, in his Baloney Detection Kit, which one finds in the book The Demon-Haunted World Science is a Candle in the Dark, 
Carl Sagan lists independent verification as the first implement. This is especially important now that we find ourselves in the information age. The internet makes information five times more accessible, but it makes misinformation at least 15 times more accessible. The challenge today isn't finding the one, but sorting it out from the other. Proverbially speaking, independent verification enables us to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that I have a number of Christian subscribers, and a few Muslim subscribers. I know that these include a few relative newcomers to my channel. One of these newcomers recently made it a point to tell me that she, di that she disagrees with me on a few key points. As far as my Abrahamic subscribers go, I have no doubt that applies to every last one of you, but I thank all of you for being willing to hear my arguments anyway. I would also hazard to guess that surely by now, most of you who have been subscribed to me and other atheists for at least a couple videos have seen by now that the images of us you've been raised on are for the most part mistaken. You've grown up with a biased preconception, a preemptive ad hominem straw man, a poisoned well. So here's what I propose. Any of you who are up to it, if you can find the time, which I understand is a pretty big if nowadays, I invite you to conduct an investigation to see just how poisoned that well is. I invite you to pick one of these oppositions, either the one between evolution and creationism, or the one between the religion of your choice and atheism, and investigate the two. I invite you to hold the two up for comparison and contrast side by side, to scrutinize both sides for any aspects that raise questions. If you choose the first opposition, then I invite you to contact a creationist authority and ask them to recommend any book, or perhaps any three or four books, which they feel do a good job of making their case. I will pit that book, whatever it is, or those books, whatever they are, against the Counter-Creationism Handbook by Mark Isaac. That's my recommendation there. If, on the other hand, you choose the second opposition, then I invite you to contact an authority in that religion to solicit the same recommendation. I will pit any books they recommend against either The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, Godless by Dan Barker, or Infidel by Ayan Hirsi Ali. Any one of those three, your choice. I understand most people are too busy to read any of these, and way too busy for all of them. But I have read all three, and hold the opinion that each gives a good accounting of itself. I also invite further suggestions from my subscribers, but keep it concise. Let's stick to just one book which you feel does a good job of making the case. There is no doubt in my mind, in this event, those of you who can find the time for this investigation will, for the most part, find yourselves completely immersed in arguments you've never heard before that you've never considered. The most of you who embark on this, on this investigation will have occasion to say, hmm, well, that's a good point. I'm also reasonably confident after this the most of you will find the evolutionary or atheist side of the argument much more firmly based than you realized. And after that, you'll probably start noticing problems you've never noticed before with arguments you've been hearing all your lives. You'll begin to realize just how poisoned your well is. In each case, it makes no difference to me which book you read first.